So I've got three problems I'd like to address in today's video. Number one, I have never loaded a shotgun shell in my life. So problem number two is that I haven't been squirrel hunting in like 15 or 20 years. When I was a kid, squirrel season came in the week before archery season for deer. So that one week, that was kind of the first time you got out in the woods, had some fun, shot some squirrels, and it got you in the mood to go deer hunting. So I'm a little bit late this year. It's late October, but that's good. The leaves are coming off. It's probably going to be a challenge to get close to them. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go squirrel hunting. Problem number three is that I have not eaten squirrel in that same 15 or 20 year period. I remember liking squirrel meat, but it's just been so long, I can't even remember what it tastes like. So we'll finish the video off with a bit of a cooking segment. If I got the camera far enough back, hopefully you can see that I've got two of these Lee Lodol two presses. I need to interrupt here. I was, I'm from the future. I was editing the video and there's a stink bug currently crawling around in the background on my dye box. Later on in the video, you're going to see some ladybugs crawling around. Now it's fall and the weather's beautiful and the doors and the windows, they're all open. And these two types of bugs are looking for a place to hang out for the winter. So they're always around and every once in a while you just gotta walk around with a shop vac and try and get rid of all the ones you can find. They don't stink unless you squish them. So as long as you don't squish them, you're fine. Just thought I'd introduce you guys. Last time one showed up in a video, somebody was like, ooh, there's a roach crawling in the background. It's not a roach. It's a stupid stink bug looking for a winter home. Okay, back to our normally scheduled program. That was a lot of twos. It's a, it's a Lee Lodol two, and I have two of them. If you're researching getting into shotgun loading, it's almost universal that people will tell you not to buy these. They'll tell you to bypass this and to go with a, with a mech setup. Like a, I think it's the Mech 600 Junior seems to be a really common recommendation for beginners. And then it just gets more complex or expensive from there. It's hard to look past how cheap these are though. You know, prices are moving fast. I think they're up to 60 or 70 bucks, but I think I got this one for around 50 a year ago. So that's a pretty attractive price, especially for a guy like me who is not going to load a bunch of shotgun. This is, this is a novelty. It's just for fun because I don't really shoot shotgun. What I'm normally buying are turkey shells, these three inch turkey shells with two ounces a shot. That's normally what I'm buying for turkeys and for squirrels or most recently I went on a pheasant shoot. So bought some pheasant loads. These are three inch number six shot. This is a one and three quarter ounce load. So I guess in shotgun language, this would be, this would be a field load. So I, I generally shoot field loads and magnum loads. I pretty much never ever shoot target loads like those Winchester double A's or the, these Remington Nitro 27 Premier Handicap. So these are two and three quarter inch shells with a one and one eighth ounce shot payload. So number seven and a half size shot or number eight size shot. It's normally what they're loaded in. I think this, yeah, the, the Winchesters are seven and a half. I, I bought these two boxes just the other day simply to get the holes because that's the first frustrating thing I ran into is all of my game shells and stuff. First of all, it's mostly three inch holes, which you can certainly reload, but the vast majority of the data and information is going to be for two and three quarter inch shells. So my plan is to eventually make three videos. One of them will be loading uh, shells for turkeys. Another one will be all about target loads. And then today is all about our game loads, which what I want to load today for squirrels is, you know, a, a bit less powerful than these, these pheasant loads. You know, these are three inch shells with a one and three quarter ounce shot load. I mean, we're going to shoot two and three quarter inch and one and an eighth ounce of shot is my plan. Now, as far as shot goes, I've got some number eight shot, probably about 20 pounds of number eight shot that my grandfather had given me years ago. It's Lawrence brand. We're not going to use this until the target shell video because number eight shot is just a little bit too small for most game. Some birds like dove loads, I think, or maybe sevens and eights, but rabbits, squirrels, stuff like that, you're gonna want fours, fives, or sixes. So this is a new 25 pound bag of number five that I bought. This is Eagle Shot that I got from Roto Metals. I'm starting off very simple when it comes to shot. And that's a, that's a pretty complex subject with the steel shot and the bismuth shot and all of the other lead free options and then various hardnesses of lead. I'm sticking with plain old magnum lead shot. Hopefully that keeps things easy. So I've picked up two different wads. The first type is called the figure eight. I ordered this bag right about the same time I bought my press. 
and it was extremely hard to find any components at that time, so I bought what was available. Turns out it wasn't a bad choice. I found lots of load data for these, and they're compatible with the holes that I want to use. So I'm hoping this will be a pretty nice kind of standard wad for the standard one and an eighth ounce load, which is what we're loading today. The second wad I bought is the WAA-12R, and these are for larger loads of shot. So whenever we get to the turkey video and we're wanting to shoot heavier, uh, heavier shot loads, one and three quarter ounce or whatever, these are what we're going to need to switch to. The problem with wads is that there are just so many options. It, it really feels overwhelming to a new person. And I've definitely found, you know, with shotgun where you need to, you need to know the exact load you're going to load before you order your components. And we'll talk a whole lot more about that here in just a few minutes. But those are the two options I've got and I'm feeling pretty confident about them. For primers, I've got these old Nobel Sport primers. My grandfather had given me these whenever he had given me the, the 16 gauge press. Did I already mention that? Yeah, the, so we'll get to the press here in just a second, but my grandfather had given me a bunch of 16 gauge crap, and there's only been like 17 of them used. So I've got a whole box of these things. These are not available anymore, I don't think. I guess they were imported in the 90s, or maybe in the 2000s. $16.89 per thousand. I wish I had a time machine. So shotgun reloaders make a huge deal out of primers, it seems to me, as a new person. If I pop the manual open to a page of load data, if you see these three loads here with the Remington figure eight, that's the wad we've got. They list separate charges for three different primers, Rem Remington, Winchester, and Federal primers. So this is, the, this is the Lyman shot shell reloading handbook, by the way. Seems to be one of the better collections of shot shell reloading info. And you know, this whole section about shot shell primers, I read it with great interest. They've got a section here where they did a pressure test, basically loaded the same load with different primers. And look at this huge variation in pressure. And then they shared another test that Hodgton had done with you know similarly scary results. So when I look at the instructions in the, the pamphlet that I got with my Lee Load All 2, in their primer section, they say any brand of primer may be used. And then later in this loads, shells, and primers section, they say primer brand will make a slight difference, not enough to concern the average shooter. Federal primers are the most powerful and Remington are the lightest. All others are in between those extremes. All are satisfactory for use with your load all too. So this is all very confusing to me. Now I should clarify, the Lee load all comes with these charge tables. And I think like those, those bold statements about primers not mattering and such apply to this generic load data. Like Lee doesn't even give you charge weights. They just tell you what bushing to use. There's a part in here somewhere yeah, under weighing charges, it's not necessary to check charges with a scale. However, should you des desire to do so, be certain to take the shell out of the normal loading sequence to ensure the proper powder is properly agitated, blah, blah, blah. So, so we've kind of got Lee, which is frustratingly oversimplifying the situation a little bit, I think. And we've got Lyman trying to scare us to death with complexity and nuance. This is what's always confused me about shot shell reloading. If you go back to the good old days of YouTube, that was like half of the gun channels. They would cut open shotgun shells and just jam random crap into it. And I didn't see people blowing up guns. Some of you might remember a long time ago on the Iraq Veteran 8888 channel when Barry was still alive and they were shooting those cut shells where they'd take a, you know, a standard, take a standard loaded shotgun shell and take a knife and make a slit around it. So that whenever it was fired, the front half of the hull went with the, the powder and the shot down the barrel and made like a poor man's slug. So not only are they significantly increasing the, the projectile payload weight, but the full diameter of the shell is now making its way down the barrel. Like this all was like, what in the world is the pressure on something like that, right? I mean, you have to think standard factory loaded shell no matter what it is, is loaded pretty stout, right? The operating pressures and stuff are, are going to be reasonably high. So how does something like that not cause a dangerous situation? Or like Talflater Mouse shoots all sorts of wacky slugs and various projectiles out of shotgun. Obviously, you know, a skilled reloader knows what he's doing. Tons and tons of experience, probably has his favorite powder that is forgiving and allows for all sorts of nonsense. I don't know. So where's the truth? Where's, where's the truth? Now th this is most relevant to me with the primers because you know, th these primers are not 
on any of the load data. I did find an old test somebody had done that included these with some others, and it was, a, it was a, one of the middle of the road options. But if we do run into problems, this might be one source of it. Yeah, and that's another thing just kind of dawned on me. You know, unless I overlooked it, like I didn't read the steel section or the bismuth loading section, but like I don't think there was any talk of things to look out for, for pressure. Like are there shotgun hole pressure signs that I should be on the lookout for? You know, the primer construction, it's, it's much different than the boxer primers we use in metallic reloading. These 209 style primers are larger and like enclosed in their own little their own little package so as far as like signs of pressure and stuff go it's almost like the primer's so big and substantial and stuff so does everything look fine until you blow your face off i don't know i'm probably going to pull out the chronograph some you know maybe we can use velocity to help us keep track of what's going on but even that might be a little bit tough because so the shotgun we're going to be shooting today my 12 gauge is a winchester model 1300 turkey gun. So it's got like a 22 inch barrel. So the velocities and stuff we see in this load data, we're going to be below it, I imagine, by quite a bit. But I do have, you know, we've got some of these that the box says 1300. We can shoot across the chronograph and see what we actually see with my rifle and maybe get an idea of what to expect out of the shorter barrel. So for powders, these are the six that I found the most load data for with the wads that I bought. You know, there, there were a lot of others, but I just don't have them. These were of the powders I own, these seem to be the best options. And just like the factory ammo, I can classify these into the three different classes. So we've got two target powders, Hodgson Clays and Winchester Super Target. So the one and an eighth ounce target loads. Got tons and tons of data for both of these with the figure eight. And these are what I'm planning to use in the target shell video. The next two are the field load powders. We've got Winchester Super Field and Alliant Unique. These are gonna get us a little bit more velocity than the two target powders I just talked about. So they're probably gonna shoot dirtier. The charge weights are gonna be higher, so they're gonna be more expensive to use. And I guess we'll have more recoil. I'm, I'm trying to think of reasons why target loaders wouldn't wanna use these. And that's all I'm coming up with. For, for us, for a game load, I want that velocity. So those are our two powders for, for today's loads. Or at least that's the plan. You know, we can change things up if something doesn't work out, but that's the plan as I get started. The next two, are Hodgton Long Shot and Alliant Blue Dot. Smokeless Magnum Shot Shell. That's what both of these are gonna be all about. So the turkey load video, where our shot weight goes way up and our powders need to get slower, these are gonna be the two. I actually found load data for, see, yeah, so, so with Blue Dot, the only load data I've got is for the WAA-12R wad. But with long shot, I actually found data for both wads. And there are some incredible velocities with Hodgton long shot. So we'll save that for the turkey shell video. So I think the next thing to talk about are holes. I need to move the camera. So the process of identifying holes and selecting the ones you want to use is where this all goes to hell in a handbasket. It becomes a confusing mess. Let me give you an example. Winchester Super X game load. Let's say I've got a bunch of these and I want to reload them and I buy my Lyman manual and I get to the section where we talk about component selection and choosing a load. They start out by acknowledging my concerns and then they say that I will probably wish to duplicate a specific factory load for some equally specific application. You may already have a number of fired cases on hand. And on this exact same freaking page is a Winchester Super X game load box. And we're talking about getting all of our information and all that stuff, right? So they've, they've set me up. I am ready to get reloading. And then we move on to the chapter about shot shell cases and they talk about the importance of, there you go, section one, case identification is crucial. So they've got pages and pages of these pictures and descriptions of different holes. So this is the beginning of the 12 gauge two and three quarter section. Federals and Fiokis and Remingtons, and I get over to the Winchester page. It's got three holes on it. Because what you want to do is, is cut one in half. So here is one of those Winchester Super X's chopped right in half. That's what it looks like. So the white portion here is what is called the base wad. So this would be called a separate plastic base wad. A couple other things you might notice. These are low brass shells, which apparently that doesn't matter. Shells with high brass are no stronger than the low brass, according to according to the manual, but you can see the inside of that is silver. So this is a plated, plated case head, and it has a separate plastic base wad. 
So the first of the Winchesters, the HS Plastic with Plastic Base Wad, it says red plastic base wad pictured actual size. So this entire lower portion is base wad. That is definitely not my shell. So the next one down the page is the compression formed plastic. And this is a one piece tapered case. It has no separate base wad. So we know for sure that's not it. It's another extremely confusing term that people use tapered versus straight wall. I'm still not sure I know exactly what they're talking about. We'll get, we'll get to that more here in just a second, but okay. So it's definitely not that one. So the last Winchester is this polyformed plastic with plastic base wad, and that's not it either. Here's another confusing thing. You remember that box of Kent shells I showed a few minutes ago? These right here. Here is the inside of one of those guys. There it is next to the Winchester. There are a few tiny differences, but I mean, well, well, the, the Kent is a three inch and this is a two and three quarter. This is high brass and this is low brass, but that base wad design is the same. So after doing a little bit of research, apparently the biggest hole manufacturer on the planet is called Chedite. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, but that's the way it's spelled. So apparently Chedite supplies holes for everybody, including folks like Winchester, whenever they need crappy holes. Got a funny comment in the, in the last video. I had, I, you know, I mentioned I was gonna be working on this shotgun video and I had a couple of these holes sitting in the background and comment came in that said, I've been reloading shot shells for decades. Those estate holes on your bench are going to be a mess. Steel base and soft plastic, not suitable for loading. You need Winchester AA or my preference, Remington STS or nitros. Holes are not the same straight wall versus taper and then one piece versus two piece holes will determine volume and if your powder wad and shot will fit. So I read that and I'm like, what the hell are estate holes? Do they just look janky and he thinks I bought them at an estate sale or something? No, uh, so estate is a brand of, of hole, a brand of shells. They make ammo. So Winchester Super X, Kent, whoever the hell they are, estate, Chedite, and a million others are this design. But I'm confused about even saying that because the manual does have a picture of a Chedite hull, and that base wad does not look like these. So it's all a freaking mess. It's all a complete and total mess. So like I showed you earlier, I went out and bought some Winchester double A's on there somewhere. And I bought some Remington Nitro 27s. These were the, the, these were the two that that guy had mentioned specifically in his comment. And I had seen these mentioned in a lot of other places that they're the best for reloading. So I'll tell you what, let's start with the, uh, with the Remington Nitro 27. This is what that guy looks like. So this is a one piece, no separate base wad whatsoever. You also notice the brass is actually brass. And another thing he had mentioned in that comment was that those, the estate holes or the cheap holes or the crappy holes he had pointed out were soft. And that was something I didn't even really think to, you know, consider but there is a, there's a major difference in the softness. Like these are just extremely soft and these are not soft at all. There's just a very, very noticeable difference in how much softer these are than this. And I guess that will come into play whenever we're forming our crimp. Here is the, the Winchester with that big, huge separate plastic base wad. Same, uh, same stiffness, you know, that they feel stiff like the, like the Remington's do. Also the brass is made of brass and these are supposed to be excellent for reloading. So these are what I'm gonna to use today. I think I'm gonna prefer the, the Remington's simply because, grab a wad real quick. So you know, our, our wad is gonna squeeze down in there, I guess about that deep, somewhere in that range. And you know, there's our powder charge there. So that all seems to go nice and smooth, but in the Winchesters, I'm worried about during, while we're, when we're seating the wad, you know, pushing the wad down onto the powder charge, like there's a bit of a ledge there and I'm worried that wad seating is going to be more challenging in these. Maybe the fit is not quite as tight as what I'm expecting or you know, whenever I'm pushing it against the, the wall of the hull, it might not be giving a good representation of what it's gonna feel like during normal seating. So we'll see how that goes. If, if one or the other seems to be easier or better to load with, I'm probably gonna go back and buy a couple more boxes of shells just so I've got a little bit of a stockpile of hulls. Now, another type I had quite a few of are Federals, some of these right here. 
And these have got a paper base wad. It's like a compressed cardboard type of thing. Now these can be reloaded. It's like once or twice, I think the manual says, is the most you should reload them. And they'll deteriorate, but you can get a couple firings out of them. Definitely feels like the, the softer plastic as well. The main thing with these is the, the wads I bought. The figure eight wads, I couldn't find any load data with the powders I have. I think there are some heavier loads that maybe we'll get to in the, the turkey video that I could you know maybe load these once just for the heck of it, but we're not gonna shoot these today. I had another, I just had a couple of them, but I also had a, a high brass version of this. And as far as I can tell, it has the same base wad. So it should be able to use the same data in both, you know, regardless of the brass height. So I'm not sure what to do with all this, all these holes. I, I don't have a bunch, but I've got enough to where if I could find a load to, to go ahead and load them once or twice, might be fun to do if just for the experience. So, so back to that straight wall versus tapered hull discussion. So with the, the one piece hull here where, you know, you can see it gets thicker down here at the same place that the Winchester is doing. So I think these are, these are tapered, right? So that's, that's the taper they're talking about, I think. So what is this? Is this tapered with that little taper? Does that count? Is this a straight wall? Or is it just garbage that nobody even talks about because nobody reloads it? I think, it's, I think that's what it is. No, nobody fools with them. So another reason I ended up going with these two, you know, the Remington and the Winchester, are because there is a ton of load data for these two when compared to some of the other holes. So I think these two are just really common, really popular, and you can find data for them everywhere. I guess what might be happening is I'm just not a normal type of person that should be reloading shotgun. The people who reload shotgun, they go to their, you know, their, their trap range and there's garbage cans full of premium holes that they can just grab. And there are sites online where you can buy once fired holes. They just, they don't seem to account for the folks that want to reload their Winchester Super X to kill some more squirrels, you know? Most people don't shoot enough of those type of shells to make it make sense to reload them. So we get the crappy components with the, you know, the estate holes and the soft plastic and stuff. So I've just, I've kind of found that a little bit lame, a little bit crappy. Had to go buy target shells I don't need just to get holes to replace perfectly good holes I thought I had, you know? So it's time to move on and, and start reloading. But one thing I'll mention is with the, the two piece you know, the separate plastic base wad, you'll see people talking about how it can be dangerous. Like if you reload these too many times and the, and the base wad comes loose, it can get lodged in the barrel and become a barrel obstruction. But I've also seen other people talk about that being like complete bull crap and nothing to worry about. So I don't know, you know, maybe a couple videos in, we've got some experience. We'll, we'll feel more comfortable loading in some of these other holes without ultra specific load data. But for now, we'll stick with the good stuff. We'll stick with what everybody else does. Okay, so for the first load, let's use the, the Remington Nitro 27 holes. We've got the, the figure eight wad. So let's look for load data for Alliant Unique. Now the Lee charge tables are a little bit light on specifics. They separate holes into plastic shells with paper base wad and paper shells is this right hand bushing column and plastic shells with plastic wad base or no wad base such as Winchester AA Remington RXP, which, which I looked it up, I guess that's before the STS was a thing. I don't know, it, it's, it's old Remington target hulls and yeah, Federal Champion II. So our premium target hulls are gonna be this column. And if we go down to one and an eighth ounce and find unique, it shows a 141 bushing. And if we flip it over and look at the bushing capacity chart and find unique, the 141 says 21.2. So let's keep that in mind as our first data point. So with the Lyman manual, I'm in the lead shot section. There's other sections for steel shot and bismuth shot, that sort of crap. So make sure you're in lead shot. We're looking under the Remington Premier STS plastic cases with a fold crimp. And the first place my eye is always looking is the wad column. So you'll see one Remington figure eight, one Remington figure eight. And this goes on for pages and pages, right? Just the, just the one and an eighth ounce target loads are multiple pages with this hole. So they show 19.5 grains. And over here, we can see the pressure is 8,800 PSI. So the highest you're gonna see is around 11,000. Here's one that's 11,000. 
and I looked around the other day, there's only a few that are in the 7,000s. So this 19.5 grain charge doesn't seem to be a, a hot load. Now, right below this, it starts the field loads, which it's a lot of the same powders, but it's just higher velocity loads. And Unique is one of the ones listed here with charge weights ranging between 22 and a half and 24 and a half, but the Remington figure eight is not listed. So using my powers of deduction, if I go back to the field load, there it is, at 19 and a half, that was 8,800 PSI, they must not have had room for more powder to list a field load. You know what I'm saying? Or at least that's my assumption as to why the, the figure eight didn't make the, didn't make the higher velocity field load section. So Unique is an Alliant powder. So the Alliant website is the next place I wanna look. And they have Unique load data listed for all of the different primers with charge weights ranging between 22.5 and 23.5. So to summarize all of that, the, the charge range we saw, 19.5, was the smallest charge. It was in the Lyman manual and it was listed as a field load and they listed it as a low pressure load. The max charge we saw was 23.5 listed on the Alliant website and everything on the Alliant site was 22 and a half to 23 and a half. The Lee recommended bushing was a, was a 0.141 and their bushing chart predicts that to be 21.2 grains. So if I look at the other bushings available and kind of make a a bushings of interest chart. And it looks like each bushing is about a one grain change in charge weight. So if we stick with that Lee recommended bushing of 141, it puts us right there in the middle of all the different loads we saw and feel, feels like a good place to be. So let's get it set up with that bushing and we'll verify some charge weights and see you know what charge we're actually gonna be throwing and such, which I guess means we need to start going over the Lee load all too. This press really doesn't have any setup or adjustment. So this press has five different stations. So like the first one is sizing and decapping. Then you put in a primer, then you slide it up into that thing. And this is where we're gonna get powder. We're gonna seat the wad, we're gonna drop the shot. Then it moves over and you start the crimp. There's two different places you can sit the, uh, the hole for the crimp starter. This is an eight fold crimp. There are also six fold crimps. So the front station is for eight fold and the back is for six. And then in the far right, that's where we finish the crimp. And the handle moves the carriage down for each of the various functions. And powder and shot get fed through hoppers up here and our bushings that get installed right there. So these are the bushings from our bushings of interest list. Just these little plastic pieces. So we're gonna start with the 141. And these are the shot bushings. This is the one and an eighth that we'll be using. Same sort of deal, just varying sizes. So it looks like, so it looks like one and seven eighths is the most this kit could ever, could ever drop because that's all you get is a little cover for the front. So one thing I'll mention, the, the one and an eighth bushing is set to throw one and an eighth ounce of number seven and a half or eight shot. All of the other bushings are accurate for number six shot. So the bigger your shot, the lighter your charges are gonna be. There's gonna end up being more empty space, right? They, they pack less dense the bigger they are. So we're gonna, we're gonna use the, the one and an eighth bushing, but we'll measure what the shot weight comes out to. It should be a little bit light with our, you know, we're shooting number five shot. Now all of the others should be pretty close. So in future videos, whenever we bump up the shot weight, we'll see how close the others are. So these two bushings install right into the front of the unit and you have to remove these two screws. And then this little thing comes out. So the powder hopper is on the left, the shot hopper is on the right. Yeah, once I pull my head out of my butt, there's no way to install them incorrectly, right? They're completely different sizes. So shot bushing goes in that side, the powder bushing goes in this side. Powder bushing's a pretty tight fit, but the shot bushing, yeah, it's not bad, it's tight enough. So we just slide this in, put the cover back on. Needing a nut driver to change those is pretty jank. A couple thumb screws, you know, something. Would have been a lot easier. I guess, you know, once you get it set up, it's not the sort of thing you'd change very often, I guess, maybe. So I wanted to go ahead and fill this thing up with powder and shot. I'm trying to think of the order of operations here. 
which way the selector should be. I think it should be on powder. Yeah, because the first thing we're going to want to do is drop a charge of powder before we drop the shot. Okay, so it's in the powder selection. Got our Alliant Unique. And there's our shot. Let's try and get the lid on there before we spill something. So one little upgrade that I found on Thingiverse and decided to 3D print is a primer catcher tray. Because the first station is where we'll be decapping and that's what this silver cover, that's where all of the primers are going to end up. So that's, that makes a total mess under there, I'm sure. So this little guy just slides in and you can put the silver cover right over top of it. I was just reading the instructions. Slide the charge bar to the left and fill the shot and powder hoppers. So that's good. We did that. We did that right. So our first station is, is sizing and depriming. And this right here is the sizing ring. So the groove goes up, slides right over the shell. So that's going to be our resize. In the lead instructions, it says that if the, the shells were fired in your gun, you don't even need to resize. We'll go ahead and resize here for the first few. So I think I just sit it right there and then bring this down. That took a fair, a fair amount of force. Looks like the sizing ring made it all the way down on there though. The next step is going to push it off of there. So looking good so far. So the next station, we need to drop a new primer in. So let me grab some primers. Here's the first primer. Drop that right into there. Then I guess move the case over. It's kind of sitting there precariously a little bit. Hopefully it'll straighten itself out. Okay, off came the sizing ring and then in goes the primer. You could definitely feel, I, I was worried that both of them were gonna be happening at the same time and it was gonna feel weird and gross, but it doesn't. Priming ring came off first and then the primer seating, you could feel it totally separate. Okay, that's off of there. There's our seated primer. Like I think it's low enough, but like if you drag your finger, you can feel, yeah, I might give it another, give it another pop just to be sure here. No, it's in there. It was good. Okay, I'll work this guy up over that. It says lower the handle. Then we move this to the right. That drops our powder. Raise the handle. Sit the wad on there. And I guess this part is what, which I think this sizing ring is gonna get in my way. I need to make sure not to leave that sitting there. Okay, that's a weird feeling, but I think that's down. I'll pull it out of there. Yeah, that wad definitely looks deep enough. Yeah, it says insert proper wad and lower the handle until it stops. So that's where we were. Slide the charge bar to the left, to add the shot, and then raise the handle. There's our shot. I think that height looks about right. So I'll tell you what, I wanna do, let's do three of them up to this point, and then we'll tear them all apart. We'll weigh how much shot got put into them and how much powder got put into them. And I don't have any sort of a loading block or something to hold this. <laughs> I wanna sit it on a shelf over here so I don't knock it over. All right, here's the next one. Deprime and size it, felt good. Drop a new primer in there. Move it over. 
Sizer comes off, primer goes in, press bottoms out, primer looks good, squeeze it under that thing, bring it down, drop the powder, raise it up. I guess you're probably supposed to put the wad on here like that, aren't you? I bet. Eh, maybe not. Okay, all the way down onto the wad, and then drop the shot. Next one up. Okay, let's do some weighing. Okay, let's see if I can pour out this shot. Looks like we got it all. Wad stayed in place. Okay, 1.133. That's pretty surprising, right? So 1.125 would be one and an eighth, right? So just a little bit heavy. Here's the second one. One point one three one, and here's the third. One point one four two. Curious what a single a single BB weighs. What was that? Five, four, five. Okay, so it looks like they're about. 0 0.005 ounces a piece and the spread on our charges was 0 0.011 so we had about a so yeah we're plus or minus one bb seems pretty good all right the shot i'm going to go ahead and dump it back in the hopper and i'm not sure how hard it's going to be to pull the wads out i'm just going to grab some needle nose i'm not sure how hard it'll be to pull these out yeah that's not bad Make sure to leave the powder behind. Looks like just a couple flakes hit the table and then one flake here on the wad. Switch that over to grains and dump it in. And of course I just dumped it everywhere. Yeah, it was 18 point something. I'm gonna have to go back in the video and look and see what it was. I did this one behind the camera instead of trying to do it through the viewfinder. Okay, 18.5, and here's the last one. 18.2. So I've thrown several more powder charges and they're all light. We, we're gonna probably need a bigger bushing. So to change the bushing, we need to empty the hoppers, which looks like it's gonna be a nightmare. So powder bottle with a funnel ready to go. And the way we do this is the handle actually pops off of each side. and then the entire body lifts off. And I'm hoping I can cover the shot while I'm pouring the powder. Yeah, I don't think I dropped any shot. Okay, that went better than I expected. And this might be a good time to talk about a problem I had with my Load All 2. As soon as it came out of the box, it was broken. The powder and shot hopper attaches with, with two screws. I'll go ahead and take them out so I can give you a view of the carnage. So these two posts where the screws go in, one of them was broken completely off and the other side was cracked. And as you can see, I did a little bit of repairs. 
I had some reinforced JB weld epoxy stuff laying around and I figured I could fix it. And I think I did, like I think it's good. But I was a little bit worried about getting started with the video and then having problems here. So I ordered a conversion kit. Another option would have been to just call Lee. I'm sure if I called him and said, hey, my thing's broke, they just would have shipped me one. And I may still do that. If it ends up breaking, I'll call him up and tell him one broke. But the advantage of buying a conversion kit is I can swap my 16 gauge one over to 12 gauge and have two 12 gauge ones, which will make everything easier. So the only thing in the conversion kit is what we were just looking at. So th this is the 16 gauge one, gauge one that I pulled off of the other one. So that entire unit gets replaced. The sizing ring is obviously different and a little plate like shell holder for the last station on the press. And then one of these things. I think the conversion kit was like 22 bucks. It, it was too affordable to pass up. And if I ever do want to load 16 gauge, you know, I'm, I've got all the stuff. Okay, got it back together there. Now, one thing I noticed was that I was leaking a little bit of powder from, you know, this sits there and slides back and forth. And I'm wondering if my repair job, I didn't realize how critical it was to get, you know, the angle just right. So this one's leaking a little bit. I'm not gonna freak out about it. The other unit that we'll use with the next load shouldn't have that problem, or at least let's hope it won't. So we need to decide what bushing to use. So we know that the 141 gave us well, I ended up throwing some more charges. 18.5 was the most I got under normal operation. So let's call that eight, let's call it 18.5. I meant to do it again before I tore this apart, but I wanted to see how heavy a charge I could get. So one time, like I kept tapping on the unit and making sure that I settled as much powder in there as I possibly could. And that charge came out to 19.2. So I don't think there's anything I'm doing that could be screwing these numbers up. It's probably just the density and characteristics of my bottle of Unique versus what, whatever was used to develop Lee's bushing charts. I also have a lot of experience with Unique in, in my pistols, like you know this exact bottle, lot number of Unique. I know that it shoots the way I expect whenever I measure by weight. So I'm not the least bit nervous here about going to a larger bushing and trying to dial in the charge weight we're after. If you don't have any load experience, I bet this would be crazy. You'd think you're gonna blow your face off for sure, but I'm feeling okay about it. So according to the bushing chart, we were jumping about one grain of powder for each bushing. So the next bushing up is the 148. And if we only get one additional grain of powder, that's only gonna take us to 19.5, which is still two grains short of where we wanted to be. So let's jump up two bushings to the 155. Here it is, the 155. Now, another thing to keep in mind, you know, we are throwing a little bit heavy with our shot charge, right? We're at just over one and an eighth. So something to just keep in mind, just kind of keeping track of all of our different variables. Yeah, see, so th this end here is the shot end and there's no gap. And then this end is the powder end and I've got a little bit of a gap. I think that's where my powder leak's coming from. I want to tear this apart real quick and just take a minute and see if I can, see if I can get rid of that. Okay, got it put back together. Just slide this down on here. And try to line up the holes on the side until it snaps in. There it is. So this time I'm just gonna load powder. Okay, so I'm gonna tear my scale with a, with a fired hole on there and we'll use this to measure our powder in. Now just to make sure it's not the scale giving us problems, there's a 20 grain check weight and that reads exactly 20. Okay, here's our first charge. 19.6. I wanna make sure I get all of the powder tapped out of this. Definitely gonna lose a little bit here and there. Here's the second, 19.6. Here's the next one, 19.5. So for this next one, I'm gonna tap on it and make sure that it gets as much powder as we can possibly get with this bushing. Okay, that's as settled as it's gonna get. 
21.5. Now we're talking. I'm going to try and do another one like that where we should definitely get the heaviest charge possible. Okay, that was with an absurd level of tapping. 22.5. Here's another one, well settled. 21.9. Okay, now I'm gonna try and stop settling it, stop tapping on it. I'm just gonna move it over to the powder side, cycle the handle up and down once and then dump the charge. That one's 19.8. Next one's 19.5, 19.2, 19.5. Okay, so that's what I would consider our bare minimum. No settling whatsoever, you know, very minimal agitation, vibration, none of that. So I'm feeling pretty good about this bushing. The light charges are right at the bottom of our weight range and the super heavy charges. That like, you know, that's like if you left powder in it overnight and just started loading the next day. You know, that first charge that's had all that time to settle would never be higher than, what do we see, 22.5 was the highest number we saw. And I'm never gonna load that way. I'm gonna be doing this every time. I'm gonna throw some charges. I'm gonna make sure I didn't do something stupid. I'm gonna open the manual and double check my load data. It's just the way I am. So I'm feeling good about this bushing. So, so normal operation where you know we're throwing powder as one function out of what takes at least seven handle pulls to load if I'm counting correct. So I think the average with all of those handle pulls in between will probably end up you know a little bit over 20, 20 to 20.5, something like that. And I'm good with that number. Okay, so let's roll with this setup and let's see if we can actually finish a shell. Okay, I've got our first three holes that are already primed. I'm gonna go ahead and use new wads. Those ones I pulled out, I'm just gonna junk them. I don't know how much it, you know, just grabbing them with pliers and pulling on them. I don't know if I might have screwed something up. I don't wanna screw something up. Now I screwed up here, I'm over in the shot side, so I need to dump a shot charge or shot load. It's a whole new lexicon, man. Gotta learn, gotta learn the words. Okay, let's try this again. Now we get powder, we lift it up. and push the press all the way down to seat the wad and drop our drop our shot and see how it looks that looks really good and just looking at the height of the shot compared to you know where the old crimp line was looks like things are going to be just about right hopefully Okay, let's find out. So, very next station is our crimp starter. Let me zoom you in a little bit. It seems like it would be important to get the, the new crimp lines lined up with the old crimp lines, but I don't know how you would do that. Should probably look at the instructions. Yeah, it looks like I, I landed right in the middle Try again. Still in the middle. This is probably this is probably stupid. I'm probably screwing everything up trying to get those. Oh, it it the whole shell twisted. You do you guys see that? So maybe it's trying to find its own alignment, perhaps. I should check the instructions real quick. It says keep an inward fold of the shell mouth toward the front for proper alignment with the segmented starter. To press the handle to a full stop, some shells may require a two second pause to set the plastic. Then the next step is to immediately move the shell into the shell holder at station five and complete the crimp. You should have a perfectly crimped shell with a nice tapered end. So what do I do here? I missed my target. I'm gonna go ahead and spread it back out by hand and try this again. So it's said to Align one of the folds with the front. Does that look straight? I think so. Let's see if the shell tries to twist on me again. Nope, it doesn't seem to have. Let's see. Yeah, that's better. That's much better. All right, so we depress it all the way to a stop.
and I'm, I've held it here for several seconds. And then I'm gonna move over to this station and push it down. I pretty much went all the way down. Holy crap. I think we made a shotgun shell. Look at that. It's like magic. That's what they're supposed to look like, right? It, it feels tight. I was shaking it a minute ago. I do feel a little bit of shaking BBs. But overall, overall it feels good. Okay, let's call that one done. I need to move the camera. I basically need to trade places with you guys because I need my head right there so I can get that crease. Yeah, so I can get one of the creases lined up pointing straight out so that crimp looks good. All right, let's see if this view works. Got our next shell. It's already sized and primed, so it needs powder. And it needs a wad. All the way down. And back down for the shot. Kind of got hung up there. And that should be that. Looks pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna line up one of the creases directly to the front. It, it wants to twist on you sometimes. Looks good. Go ahead all the way down and hold it for a couple seconds. Then I'll lift up, move it over here, and all the way down. Hold that for a couple seconds, I guess. Okay. And that's looking good. I'm happy with that. Very happy with that. Okay, here's our third. It needs powder. And a wad. And then shot. Crimp start. And crimp finish. That is another beauty. Okay, let's go ahead and do two more from start to finish. So sizing ring with the groove up into station one, which is going to decap and push that sizer down. It's going to stop at a hard stop. Move the whole deal over. Nope, oh, hold on. Need to put in a primer. There's our primer. Guy, yeah, first first part's going to push off the sizing ring, and the second part's going to seat the primer. Sizing ring off, primer looks good. Over to the next station. First step is powder, and next is a wad. Take that down until it stops. 
come up and back down. Just kind of want to make sure, I, I, don't, I need to read the instructions, I guess, but just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to bring the wad back up before I come back down and drop the shot and have a look. Everything looks right. So groove straight toward me. And all the way down. Hold it for a couple seconds. Come up, move it over, and then all the way down on this guy. Holding that for a couple seconds as well. There it is. Feels good, feels great. Sizing ring on the next piece, and the process starts over. Here it is, number five. Okay, so I'm trying to decide what to do next because it's after dark. So I need to wait until in the morning to shoot. And I'm trying to decide whether to go ahead and set up the other one with the other load or wait and shoot these first to see how it goes before we load anymore. Yeah, let's go ahead and load some of those. I don't feel like waiting. My original plan was to mount this second unit to a two by 12 and then clamp that to the bench but that was going to be a pretty big pain in the butt. So I just grabbed some deck screws and screwed it straight to the bench. So I want to leave the first unit set up. So I'm going to, have to be extremely careful not to end up in a powder mix up. So you can see I wrote unique on the front of it right there with a paint marker because powder mix up are the easiest way to blow your face off. So unit number two is going to be the Winchester hulls and the powder is going to be Winchester WSF. So the data source for this one is going to be the Lyman manual, Winchester HS or compression form plastic cases with a fold crimp, two and three quarter inches, one and one eighth ounce field loads. Here is Winchester WSF, 25.5 grains with our Remington figure eight wad. And the pressure on this one is a lot like our unique load. So all the way down at 8,000. While I've got this page open, down here are the long shot loads I was talking about at the beginning of the video, or I was saying I had a load for the Remington figure eight with long shot, that's it right there. And the freaking velocity is 1508. That is smoking fast. But back to our WSF load, 25.5 grains. Unfortunately, Hodgton, which owns Winchester, they don't have any load data on their website with the figure eight and WSF. So. This is our only source, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. So the bushings of interest with this powder are some of the same ones we were trying for unique and a couple that are a little bit smaller. It looks like the, you know, according to the Lee bushing chart, the 128 bushing should give us 25 grains of WSF. So that would be a half grain below what was in the Lyman manual, which would be just about perfect. So that's the first step. There's our 128 and here is our one and an eighth ounce shot bushing. We'll go through all the same tests. We'll make sure that this bushing is throwing as close as the other one was. And ho hopefully this one will go pretty easy. Okay, quick double check. That is the one and one eighth bushing. That is the 128, which is the one we need. And just to give you an update on the other unit, my repair seems to have worked. I didn't notice any leaking powder. And I'll keep an eye out with this one as well. I'm gonna use the same technique to 
lay the charges here. Just tear my scale with a hull. First charge, 23.7. Second was 23.4. Next one's 23.4. Okay, so that, I get those, those two in a row we just had that were 23.4, that was with, you know, basically no settling. So that tells us what we'll probably see as a minimum. Let's try to settle this next one in. So we'll bring this over here. I'll tap on the unit a bit. And that should be a very heavy charge. And that is 25.7. Okay, so if you remember our manual, 25.5 is what it was listed. So to get over that, we've got to bang on it like an idiot. So th this, this seems good. Now, in case you're thinking this is a lot of variation and you're kind of blaming it on Lee, like, wow, what a piece of crap. This is normal. You're going to see this on anything. Different designs of powder dispensers can minimize it a little bit, but there's always a big difference between a charge that's been settled with vibration or time or whatever versus one that hasn't. So just like this, kind of sitting like, okay, what's the, what's the minimum I'm going to see out of this with a really light charge? And then what's the maximum I'm going to see with a ton of settling? And if both of those numbers are safe numbers, then it makes me feel pretty safe. Okay, I say we roll with this. Uh, let me fill up the shot hopper and we'll make sure this one and an eighth ounce insert is metering correctly. Okay, I've switched the scale to ounces. So let's see what we get. That wasn't very smart. Okay, this first load of shot is 1.113, so just a little bit light. Okay, here's the second one, 1.115. Okay, the next one is 1.116. So that's pretty interesting. So this bushing is acting like we expected, like the manual said, where the one and eighth bushing is calibrated for number seven and a half and number eight shot, and we should be just a little bit light with our larger number five shot. And this one we clearly are. Interesting that the two machines are different. I think we're ready to load. Let's get some primers ready. We'll do five of these as well. So let's get five shells ready. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Got the sizing ring, groove side up. That primer came out a lot tougher. Yeah, I don't see anything weird going on. Sizing ring went all the way on. Okay. Priming felt good. Sizing ring came loose. Primer depth feels good. Go in here, get our powder charge. So I'm a little bit worried about wad seating in this hole. So I wanna pay close attention to what this feels like going down in there. if it's you know if it hits that taper it 
felt smooth. It's felt smooth the whole way. I didn't even feel it. That's all the way down. Interesting. Yeah, it looks to be seated all the way down in there. It's definitely down about where the old crimp mark is. So it looks perfect. I was worrying over nothing. Okay, let's drop our shot. And see what that looks like. It looks perfect. That's what it looks like. Right at the top of the wad. See if we can get this guy to crimp. Got a crease pointed right to the front. Take it a little way and we'll check. Yeah, that looks good. Could zoom you in a little bit. Looking good so far. Take it all the way down. Got to leave it down for a couple seconds. And then bring it up. Looking good. Leave that one down for a few seconds and see what we got. That is what we've got. That looks fantastic. Yeah, it looks great. Let's do a couple more. Armor looks good. So this one's definitely leaking some powder as well, just to keep you all up to date on that situation. I'm gonna try and pay attention again with this wad. Yeah, it's just smooth seating. I'm not feeling anything weird from that, that big tapered base wad. Yeah, they're seating in there nicely. I should have used longer screws. I had noticed that it was starting to give a little bit. That is my own fault. It's gonna be fun to clean up. Okay, back in business. Where was I? This one just got a new primer, but I better just double check, make sure it got 
fully seated. It looked like it did, but figured I better be sure. Feels like we should probably discard this powder charge. So let's drop that and discard it and same way with this shot, just to be sure. So the knob was kind of hard to get pushed to the left to drop the shot there. That might mean a slightly heavy drop of shot. But if it is, I don't think it's too bad. Extra BB or two maybe. I think we should have a pretty good safety margin with this, with this powder. So minor little things like that shouldn't matter too much. At least I hope not. That's another good looking crimp to my untrained eye. I don't really know, looking for things that are loose. It doesn't look the least bit loose, nice and tight. Okay, one more to load here. So there we are, the first 10 reloads. Things look really good to my untrained eye. The crimps seem, you know, sturdy. All right, first thing I need to do is get a shop vac and try and clean this place up. Then we can get out to the range, see if these will shoot. All right, here's my Winchester 1300 12 gauge. So I'm swapping out my aftermarket turkey choke, like an extra full choke for the standard Winchester full choke. A full choke is generally what we want for squirrels. So I brought out my Caldwell chronograph and so far it seems to be giving good readings. I was trying some of the factory ammo to make sure the setup was gonna work. I've got a target at 20 yards and I wanted to get some baseline patterns and that's what I've got over here. Here's a pattern from the Winchester double A's. This one's that Kent pheasant ammo. And over there's the Nitro 27. We'll look closer at those later. So I did bring out my magneto speed chronograph and apparently it's supposed to work with shotgun, but. It wasn't giving me good readings. I must need to mess with the sensitivity settings, but the Caldwell was working so well, I'm not gonna worry about it. So I've got velocities for those three types of factory ammo. So the Nitro 27, supposed to be 1,235 feet per second, and across six shots, I got an average velocity of 1,188 in this gun. So that's 47 feet per second slower than the box said. The others were close to that. So I'm thinking 40 or 50 feet per second below What's expected should be about normal for this gun. So I figure our reloads will be like 11, 1150 maybe, something like that. Let's find out, let's, let's see. I wanna start with the unique load, the first one we loaded. I guess the first test. So that's the, the Nitro 27 hole. See if it fits in the gun. Yep, went in the gun no problem. So let's just grip it and rip it here. Okay, so velocity on that was only 1,002 feet per second. Let me go pull the target so we don't mess up our pattern. Pattern's a touch high, but still looks pretty good. I mean, we've got 15 or so pellets right there in this two inch circle. The hole looks good. Don't see anything weird going on on it. The barrel's clear. Checked it for no good reason. 
So let's shoot another one here. I guess I should check to see if they'll feed from the tube. Why not? Okay, that one was only 879 feet per second. And that was 945. I'm gonna go hang another target and we'll try WSF. Okay, Winchester Halls with WSF. Okay, that was 1161. That's more like what we were expecting. Boy, and the pattern looks pretty good too. Maybe just a little bit high like we saw with Unique, but still a lot, a lot of pellets in our kill zone. Okay, like we did with Unique, let's, uh, let's shoot two more. Let's feed them from the tube. That was 1183. And 1153. Tell you what, I'm liking the way this WSF load's working. Velocity's right about what we were expecting. 1161, 1183, 1153. And you know, with, with Unique, our, our velocity was way low. And then if you remember back to the loading process, we're already shooting, what was it? We're shooting two bushings larger than we were supposed to. Our velocity's still way low. I mean, it should just be a matter of picking a larger bushing and getting the, the charge weight up where it's supposed to be. But it still makes you kind of nervous when things don't come out the way they're supposed to. And here with the WSF load, everything's coming out exactly the way it's supposed to. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the target out double the distance. So let's go to 40 yards and let's get some patterns there. Okay, the target's out at 40 now. So the pattern opened up quite a lot, still got a couple BBs in the red. I'm gonna hang a new target and do the same thing again. So the pattern on that one looks pretty similar. Only one in the orange, a couple around. I definitely call this max range. So I've hung one last target and I wanna shoot one of the types of factory ammo. I think I wanna do the Kent. This is gonna have the best pattern out at this range because it's a one and three quarter ounce load, right? So our, the pellet count's gonna be much higher. It's number six shot and it's one and three quarter ounce. So comparing it directly to our own load is probably a good way to feel bad about ourselves, but I, I'm curious as to how it would shoot out here. So let's see what happens. The recoil on these is, is awful. That's another thing I meant to mention is if you didn't have a chronograph, I would still know that unique load was weak because the recoil was much less than everything else. Like it just, it felt like a weak load. And this, the WSF load feels a lot like the, you know, the target factory ammo. Now this Kent stuff with the heavier shot load and all that has a whole lot more recoil than anything else I'm shooting. So if you feel like you're pretty good at tracking recoil on the different types of loads, I mean, that's a really good feedback, I think, about how hot you've got your loads. All right, let's shoot this one. Trying to get a hold of this thing. This one surprises me. This Kent pattern is, is no better than our WSF pattern. Maybe just, maybe a little bit more density, but as far as, you know, no, nothing, nothing in the red, and just a couple in that area. Interesting. All right, let's, let's get back to the bench. I think while I'm out here, I need to make sure I keep my twice fired holes separate from the one, oh, I guess the, the primer color. Yeah, those Noble Sport primers I'm using are distinct. So that'll help me keep track of things, but don't want to get things mixed up. But I got a, got a few rounds left. I'm gonna go ahead and empty them. So yeah, let's get back to the bench. I mean, I think we're ready to go squirrel hunting.
You know what's just about impossible to find in the leaves? A freaking gold hole. It never even dawned on me, man. It took me forever to pick these up. Couldn't find them. So I guess that's another good thing about our WSF load in these uh, Winchester holes. Dark gray is not much better, but it definitely is better. I could go for like an orange. So I shot through the rest of that box and I've got 19 once fired holes that I'm gonna load up to hunt with. And a hawk just attacked my chickens. Be right back. Okay, all of the chickens are fine, but I forgot where I was and what I was talking about. It's happened a couple times, man. I've had some hawks come down. One day they were freaking out. I walk out and the hawk is just perched up on the power lines. I think this one actually took a swoop at them, but everybody seems okay. A couple days locked in the coop while we squirrel hunt might be a good idea. So let's see, we already talked about the holes, right? I've got 19 of them. It's the remainder of my once fired double A holes. And I wanted to show you guys this. It's another thing I had 3D printed. It's a replacement lid because you know, this is what these come with on top. You know, a little compartment full of this crap. And I didn't want all of this on top of it while I was using it. I didn't realize you can just use this. You can just leave all of this crap sitting on the bench and use this as a cap while you're using it. So that's what I've been doing. But I saw this on Thingiverse. It's a replacement lid. It's got a space for the sizing ring to sit. And there's several different accessories you can snap on this side. I chose the primer holder. So I've got my 19 primers ready to go and actually fit pretty good. This was posted on Thingiverse in 2019. This was funny then, it's still funny today. So maybe I'll use it as a lid one day, but for right now it's a nice little primer holder. Okay, I'm gonna get started and load all 19 of these.
So I was expecting a janky experience with the Lee Lodol press. Broken parts from shipping damage, powder leaking, feels like it might fall apart at any minute. I expected the crimp would be kind of janky as well. But man, I am really happy with these. They, they feel tight. Like I'm not worried at all about throwing some of these shells in my pocket while I'm squirrel hunting. And I figured that might not be the case, you know? I guess I've loaded about 30 rounds so far and haven't had a crimp problem with a single one. That is really good. Okay, so we've got our ammo and it's time to go squirrel hunting. So I dropped some shot into my powder. And I really, I don't want shot in my powder. So I'm gonna try the panning for gold technique here. Just gonna put it back in the container little by little. Starting to hear them rolling around in there.
So that was some of the easiest hunting I've ever done. Just walked a couple hundred yards behind the house and there were squirrels everywhere. Now some days you'll go out there, that there's no chipmunks moving, the squirrels aren't moving. So it's not always that easy, but it's not all that hard to find squirrels. Even most of the public land I've been on has a pretty good squirrel population. So it's about the easiest entry into hunting. Like if you just wanted to go hunting for the first time, squirrel hunting's about the perfect way to do it. I will confess, the whole time I was out there, you know, down in the bottom of that valley with these squirrels all over me, I really wished I had a 22 with a nice scope on it. Because that's the perfect setup for, for rifle shooting because I could just walk up the hill, get set up, and all of my shots would definitely be into the dirt. So if you're looking for a serious marksmanship challenge, then shooting them in the head with a 22 is about as tough as it gets. Just got to make sure you got a good backstop because bullets can go a long way. So cleaning the squirrels. I did film myself cleaning the squirrels, but it took a while to get back in the groove. I watched some videos on YouTube, like the main one, the one you'll probably get recommended if you search how to skin a squirrel is a meat eater, you know, Stephen Ranella video. So a really good video, really good audio, really good explanation, and a really good technique. You basically cut through the tail and skin down the back a little bit and then hold the tail under your boot and just lift them straight out of their skin. A little bit more to it than that, but not much. The skinning part wasn't a problem for me. It was the gutting part was a little bit more difficult and primarily just dealing with the pelvis. In that cleaning video, they had used a set of shears and I didn't have a set, but I ordered a set because that looks really, really easy. So next time I'm cleaning squirrels, I'll be more prepared. So the first three I got on, on the first day I went out and those three have been in the fridge for four days. And then yesterday I was back out and I got that last one and since then, I've had them soaking in a, in a brine. Just covered them all up with water and put like four tablespoons of salt in there. So they've been in that for about 24 hours. It's definitely not necessary, but you know, you see the, the water's tinged red. And most of that is, you know, some of them got hit with several BBs. I think this one in particular had some bloodshot and stuff in here. And that's all gone now that they've soaked. Yeah, there's a little bit more here. I'll just cut that out. But overall, as far as shotgun squirrels go, this isn't too bad. None of them were super close. That first one that I didn't shoot that was only five yards away, that, I mean, that's exactly why I didn't shoot it, is because it would be so full of shot that the, that the meat would be ruined. I guess I could get the, the, uh, the pot of bloody water out of the shot. So I got them all rinsed off and dried. Now I want to finish cleaning them up and cut them into pieces. And all the while I'm looking for buckshot. Just found a piece. Right there. So pretty much all of the squirrel recipes I found have you prepare the squirrel in some way and then do a really long braise or a really long roast until the meat will fall off the bones. And one of the videos I found was uh, Preacher's Day Off was making squirrel and dumplings. Growing up, like I think we would normally fry the squirrels and just eat them tough. And my great grandmother always made squirrel gravy. And that, that was my plan. I was going to make squirrel gravy with mashed potatoes, maybe some cornbread. But I'm not in the mood for mashed potatoes, and I, I like the idea of the dumplings. So the way I saw most people sectioning these up was just with a big knife. Okay, that wasn't as easy as they made it look. Or maybe this knife is just too wimpy. I think I should have chopped the front legs in the same way. So one of the best parts here is this back portion with the tenderloins in here and kind of the equivalent of their back strap. I think I'm going to try and chop this in half. And those are the different sections. There's really quite a lot of meat on these. Now this meat does not have any offensive smell whatsoever. It really doesn't have any smell. If you're dealing with somebody at home that's squeamish, it's really not that hard to process it to this point out in the field and then just come home with a baggie full of parts like this. It's just neutral smelling meat. So to me, it's, it's, it's a whole lot less gross than some slimy pink chicken that comes out of a package from the grocery store. You know what I'm saying? Like with that big blood diaper under it. Like, the, oh God, isn't that gross? 
The blood diapers gross me out. There's just something so satisfying about lighting a gas burner, you know? Like, I, I gotta put the pot on here first, but... It's gonna be in the way of the camera. See that? That's not nearly as dramatic. I'm gonna use a Dutch oven. Because I, I think I'm probably gonna go to the oven with this. I wanna fry them in some oil, get some color on it, and then just cover it with chicken broth or chicken stock. So I slaughtered my first pig a couple weeks ago, so now I've got a bunch of lard. So let's go ahead and turn the fire on for real this time. And start with a big, couple big chunks of lard. It's good for you. Pasture raised, high in omegas and stuff. Just going to start. Just going to start throwing our hunks in there. That's only about half of it, but I really don't want to crowd the pan or it'll take forever to get some color on these. So we'll do half of it at a time. A lot of people will bread the pieces for this part and then later, once you know, you've got them submerged in water, I guess a lot of the breading comes off and thickens your gravy and stuff. I could season these a bit right now, but I'm a little bit worried about the, the chicken stock I'm using. I just made it two days ago, and it's pretty potent. Like, it's, it's seasoned pretty heavily. So I think I'm just going to wait till near the end to adjust any seasoning. Too much darn water coming out of these. I guess I didn't really put two and two together where I had soaked these in brine. There might just be too much water to get any, any browning right now. That's probably what's going on. I'm a moron. That's okay. I'll let them go a little bit longer. Yeah, and speaking of the salt brine, you know, I'm not sure how much saltiness this will have taken on. So that's another good reason to, to wait till the end to add any additional seasoning. It smells pretty incredible now. Probably mostly from the lard. Yeah, I might have spoke too soon. I'm picking up a little color. This has been about 10 minutes on high heat. Okay, that's just about where I want to be. I need some tongs. trying to keep things moving quite a bit so all that all that awesome browning we've developed doesn't become black and gross and burnt I can't really decide whether to do this on stovetop or whether to put the whole thing in an oven 
We could go with like a 250 oven for several hours. The main point of the next step is going to be to, to cook it down until all the meat wants to fall off the bone. And then at that point, I'll retrieve all of the chunks of meat out and debone everything. And we'll add that meat back to the broth we've developed. Top it off with more chicken stock, how much ever we need to, to do our dumplings. That's kind of the loose plan here, making it up as we go. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and preheat the oven, preheat the oven to 250. Okay, so this is getting some good color. I think we're ready. This is that chicken stock I made. Nice little crust of fat on there. <laughs> I'll grab a little bit of water, make sure I get all the good stuff out of here. I cooked this stock down for like 24 hours. So it came out like super gelatinous. I wanted to add the stock before I put the rest of the meat back in just so I had an opportunity to deglaze the pan a little bit easier without all the meat being in the way. That is perfect. Let's bring the rest of our meat chunks back. There's our oven ready at 250. That stock smells so good. I'm going to go ahead and bring this up to simmering here on the on the, the burner before we go into the stove. Put that other jar of stock back in the fridge. Should probably go ahead and put the lid on. If if for no other reason, just to warm it up, get it yeah, get it preheated. All right, yeah, that's enough. Didn't quite want to get it rolling that hard. That's okay. All right, so this is going to go in that 250 oven for a couple hours. And while that's going on, let's get back to the bench and wrap up our discussion about the shotgun stuff. All right, so these are the four holes that killed our squirrels. Just noticing that mark on that one. I guess maybe the scuffing in the wear up here is the main thing to look out for, I guess. Very happy with our load. You know, WSF going about, what was it, 1160 feet per second, something like that. Got the job done, very happy with that performance on squirrels. That first shot was probably stretching it a little bit much, but the shells did their job. So these are the other 15 that didn't get fired. Most of them have been in and out of the gun a couple times, and some of them have been carried in my pocket. One thing I have noticed as I edit the video and get a little bit better look at these crimps. This load in particular does have an open spot in the center on some of them, you know, and I, I could see a BB down in there sometimes. And some of them are a little swirly. I'm assuming I didn't have my crimp stations aligned just right. And I definitely got some variation. You can see this one's much more concave and then that one's kind of poking out just a little bit. So did I not quite get this one done all the way? Or did the pellets just maybe pack in a little bit different between the two? I'm not sure. Both of them are holding together just fine and there's a pretty wide range of, you know, in between. There are a couple others that bulge just a tiny bit and some that really dish down in there. It might not be anything to worry about. I mean, the only problem we really had was with the velocity being so low with Unique and, you know, we had to go up two bushings and such. So the Lee bushing tables being wrong for Unique were really the only hiccup at all. And it was also extremely easy. So there were a lot of positives, but man, these things are jank, right? I felt like the thing was gonna break in half the whole time. Especially that this old one, you know, this is my grandfather's old one, but my new one's kind of the same way. The, the big silver post, you look how it attaches. It slides down into this, it slides down into there and then it's held with the one screw. The problem is with, with my grandpa's old one, I probably need to trim some plastic or something, but it doesn't slide smoothly or it, it slides smoothly, it's just there's some resistance. So if I clean up whatever's going on in here that's dragging, that might help 
to keep pressure off the silver post. Because what was happening is like all the way down, I'm kind of bending that post forward. So just, just watching it back while I'm editing, it was a little crazy, you know, watching that post flop back and forth and move around so much. Another problem I saw on both units was alignment. You know, down here at the bottom where the shell sits, it can move around a bit. Like this first station where the sizer goes on and this come down, like getting it aligned properly with the primer. And then once it's down and pushing on the sizing ring, I found myself fiddling with the alignment a lot. And the same thing on the next station with the priming or, you know, the, the removing of the sizing ring and the priming. It wasn't bad and it worked and everything was fine. It just it like, it took a, an extra few seconds every time to, to watch your alignment. But that's a pretty lame nitpick, right? As far as operations go, the thing just operated very simply. One thing that made me a little bit nervous is whenever I was seating the wad, so during wad seating, I would bottom the press all the way out. So I was always a little bit nervous that the wad didn't get seated all the way down. Didn't have any problems. And you know, it, it's pretty easy to just look into the, the mouth of the hole and, and look at where your, where your wad height is. But it made me a little bit nervous and also made me think like, okay, what if, what if it wasn't getting them all the way down as far as I wanted or as much pressure as I wanted? There's no adjustment. You're out of, you're out of travel on the handle. So I don't know what you'd do. And the station where that would be a big problem, I guess, is at the, the crimp finishing, because it's the same way. You know, when you're coming down to finish the crimp, it hits that little shell holder there. And you know, finishing that crimp properly was like my biggest concern and the thing I wanted to make sure of each time. So I was putting a lot of downward force to make sure I was completely bottomed out. And I, I was probably just doing a little bit too much or, or way more than was necessary. Because sometimes I could see that that little metal piece flex a little bit because I was pushing down hard and such. It, it didn't bend or anything. I don't think I messed anything up. I don't know. I operate presses like a gorilla, and I know that. So I just know it's a matter of time, right? This, this press would not stand up to loading a ton of shells with me as an operator. Oh, another thing, you know, the the powder leaking that I had mentioned which it's, you know, it's all about that slop right there, just letting powder granules between here. I'm probably gonna do some work with a file on this one as well to try and to try and get rid of this little gap right here. There's not much, but there's enough. You know, we're, we're just talking about a couple grains of powder, but it's annoying, people notice it. Oh, here's a hot tip. Do not, under any circumstances, write on the front of your Lee Load All 2 with a Sharpie silver metallic. That is not coming off, man. I've tried alcohol so far. I'm gonna hit some, hit it with some acetone probably. That ought to do it. But I'll probably switch to stickers for labeling my presses. Emptying these things is a freaking pain in the butt. I was trying to do powder first and then shot, but I think shot first is the way to go. Cause the, you know, the powder hopper is smaller than the shot one. So it's a little bit easier to cover. But man, that's a janky way to empty empty a press, you know? Same deal with swapping bushings, that's a pain in the butt. Like I mentioned earlier, I assume the idea is you get it set up for your load and then you just don't mess with it. I think for somebody who just wants to play around, like my exact scenario, where you're not really expecting much, you know you're buying something that's a little bit janky, but you just wanna have some fun, load a few shotgun shells, like man, it's worth every penny. I'd rather buy one of these than not load shotgun at all, right? But with, especially with component costs creeping up, this bag of lead was $85. Hold on, let me look that up. It was $77. So it was it was about 90 bucks shipped to me. So somebody getting into shot shell reloading in a serious way is not going to expect their press to be half the cost of their first bag of shot. You know what I'm saying? The presses from Mech that start between two or three hundred dollars are probably going to be worth the upgrade. But you know, who do I know? How do I know? Every shotgun shell I've ever loaded was right here in this video. So I've completely changed my plan going forward from here. And I'll walk you through my thought process. I've already told you that I want to load some Magnum turkey shells. The problem is Magnum lead turkey shells are quickly becoming a thing of the past. The tungsten shot started hitting the market a few years back and it changed everything in the turkey world. You know, it went from where folks are shooting big three and a half inch 12 gauges or 10 gauges to now a lot of people prefer 20 gauge with TSS and a 12 gauge with TSS where before, you know, you might have a 40 yard max range on turkeys, that, that stuff can stretch it out to 50, 60, 70 ridiculous yardage because the, the tungsten shot 
is like 50 something percent more dense than lead shot. So instead of shooting number fours or fives that might be traditional for turkey, they use like number nine or even smaller because each of those BBs is so much more dense. You want that ridiculously high uh, shot count, you know, the, the, the number of BBs that you can get from the smaller shot. So I need to load tungsten in my turkey video. It's stupid expensive. It's $50 a pound for the cheapest stuff you can get. So this, this 25 pound bag of shot that I was just complaining about spending $90 on would be $1,200 if it was tungsten. And the box is a factory ammo. 10 shots is like $70, $80. They're like, yeah, seven or $8, $10 a shot. Now the good news though is you don't have to buy a 25 pound bag. There's, you can buy two pounds. You can buy one pound at a time, I think. And also for like me, so I don't wanna shoot two ounce. I don't wanna shoot two ounces a shot. It is miserable shooting these. The recoil is insane. You know, some of that has, has to do with my shotgun, but my shotgun kicks like a mule with these things. If I could switch to tungsten and shoot like, you know, one and an eighth ounce like we did today, or maybe one and a half, one and a half ounce, that'll save on shot cost with the expensive tung tungsten and also have a whole lot less recoil. So this is all fine and, and nothing I've said has really ruled out using the Lee Load All 2 to make those. What really made me start thinking about something else is this gun right here. This is my 410. This is the first gun I ever got. My great grandpa got it for me. It's an old Harrington and Richardson. There we go. It's an old, it's an old Harrington and Richardson Deluxe Topper Model 198. Just a good old simple single shot 410 with a full choke. So what could I do with tungsten? They call it TSS. What could I do with TSS, tungsten super shot in 410? Instead of the one and an eighth ounce loads that I loaded today for squirrels, I might be able to load a little 410 shell with TSS that has similar ballistics, very light recoil, and I get to use my old, my old 410. That'd be fun. Use this for all my squirrel killing and do it with some pretty neat rounds that I loaded myself. That sounds like fun. So the problem with this is I don't have a 410 press and Lee does not make a load all two for 410. The entry level mech single stage stuff, the, the 600 junior, and there's one called the size master. That's a little bit more expensive. Both of those are available in 410 and I can get the parts, you know, necessary to, to switch between 12 gauge and 410. So that's what I've been thinking about the last couple days. And I, I haven't really fully researched it yet as far as, you know, what other people out there are doing with tungsten in 410. This was mainly just, you know, I was reading about what people were doing for turkeys and my mind started wandering a little bit. Now, a couple things about tungsten. There, there are some problems. You know, you could imagine the same thing happening in the metallic reloading world. Imagine if you're your 150 grain Sierra Match King, all of a sudden tomorrow, they say, okay, here's your 200 grain Sierra Match King, exact same bullet dimensions. Like everything changes, you know, from barrel twist to powder selection, it's a whole new world. And it still seems like adapting TSS into a world of lead requires some creative reloading. Some of this stuff in my grandpa's old uh, 16 gauge stuff, like here's some card wads and same thing over here. So stuff like this and overshot cards and doing whatever you've got to do to work with existing wads with that super heavy load of TSS and getting, you know, getting the column right, whatever they call that, where it's powder, wad, and shot, all needs to be the proper length to get a proper crimp. So as a noob who's loaded like 30 rounds in his life, I know there's gonna be a lot of learning to do to get things right with TSS. But it seems like it's gonna be worth the trouble, right? Because you know, as I'm looking into it, it just seems like a waste of time to go through with my regular plan and just use lead shot. You know, maybe we'll do both. So any of you experienced shotgunners, I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback, especially if you if you have any experience with TSS. Do I, do I sound like I'm on the right track? Is TSS really as awesome as they say it is? All the reports are pretty clear on that one. You know, TSS seems pretty darn awesome and so does loading with non-toxic stuff. You know, like right now down there in the oven, we got some lead shot that we've got to get to, we got to find it, would rather not eat it. And you know, for that 410 load, the shot size is probably going to be minuscule, like a half ounce or something like that. So, you know, I think the cost of TSS is still going to, I think 410 shells are super expensive to buy these days anyway. I need to get some holes. Yeah, it's kind of a whole new thing I got to look into and learn about if I'm going to go down that path. So I don't know, I'm rambling. You guys let me know what you think.
if any of this, first of all, the, the Mech 600 Junior versus the Size Master. The price jump there doesn't seem too ridiculous. So if any of you guys have Size Master experience and want to talk me into that over the 600 Junior, I'm listening. Or if you say this is all very stupid, you had a plan, you should stick to the plan. Load your basic shells on your Lee Load All 2 and get back to metallic stuff as quick as you can. That, that's another option. And I guess that'll probably depend on the reception to this video. If nobody's watching, then it might be better to just stick with the original plan and buy my TSS shells. Sounds pretty cool though. I think it'd be fun to play with. So is there anything else, anything else we need to talk about here? Nothing's really coming to mind. Like the problem is that we didn't have any problems. We're not coming out of this video with some m issue that I need your help with and that I'm struggling with. This was, this was all pretty straightforward. Worked out great. I still got time before the squirrel needs to come out of the oven, so I might just turn off the camera and think for a few minutes. Feels like we covered a lot of ground. Let's see what we got. I'll take a fork and see. Just kind of test it. Nope, definitely not there yet. But might as well give it a little stir. Yeah, definitely needs more time. I think we've got enough brazing liquid here. So back in it goes. We've reached the three hour mark. So let's see, see what we've got here. Looking good. It smells awesome. I smell the chicken broth, maybe some lard. Not picking up anything funky from the from the squirrel. All right, now we're starting to tear apart, looks like. Yeah, right here we've got some, definitely wanting to separate. Just, I got a feeling I'm about to burn myself, you know what I mean? Like I need to, I need to do something with this hot lid. We'll just set it back here. There we go. Actually, these gloves are gonna be perfect for this. That's what I'm gonna do. The bones are so small and fine, this probably isn't gonna work, but it's worth a try. No, let's try one gloved hand and then the other running the fork. I'll tell you, there's some bizarre anatomy going on in these animals. Yeah, this glove is terrible working with these little bones. What I need to do is get the rest of the pieces out so that they can start cooling down enough that I can handle them without those stupid gloves. I might be pulling these just a little bit early. They're not quite wanting to fall apart as much as I'd like to see. I think we'll be all right though. I don't want the meat to turn to mush though. I think I heard a BB or two floating around in the pot. Man, this looks amazing. <laughs> this looks absolutely amazing. Tell you what, here's a big hunk out of one of the backs. Like that's a nice big hunk of meat. I'm gonna give it a try here. It's amazing. It's just, it's neutral meat. Like there's nothing offensive about it whatsoever or gamey. It's just maybe a touch chewy, a touch dry, but not bad at all. All right, let's try some gloves with a little bit better dexterity. Yes, that's much easier. Forgot to shut that oven off. There are a bunch of little floating rib bones. So you gotta watch out for those. Now a lot of the gravy recipes expect you to do this at the table. So this is a lot of work, but not always necessary. You spit the bones you find on one side of the plate and you spit the shot on the other. So I'm not gonna lie to you, this has been tedious. A few minutes ago, I was like, man, I need to put on an audio book. Tell you what though, this pile of meat, man, looks so good. You could substitute this in anywhere that you used like a shredded chicken. I was sitting here thinking like, uh, like a chicken salad, but squirrel instead. A squirrel salad sandwich, I think it would be good. Just found my first BB, right there, first one. 
I was surprised I expected to find more, but I removed a lot when I was dressing them. And speaking of that, like that, that video I talked about with Steve Ranella, the guy who was demonstrating, whenever he pieced out the squirrel, he cut that entire forward or the entire rib section out and tossed it and said something like, there's not, there's not much usable meat there. Well, there's a ton of meat there. So whenever I was cleaning them, I didn't, I didn't cut that out. That's where all these crazy floating bones are, I bet. So it's not really that there's no meat there. It's that the meat that's there is not worth going after. You, you'll run into that sometimes. Processing deer, or I mean, I just, you know, processed a pig and it was even harder there. Like you, you get to a point where you just got to say it's not worth it anymore. I'm no longer getting cuts of meat that I'm going to be, you know, ready to use. I mean, sure, somebody in the world probably eats pig snout, but I never have and don't really want to try. Like I just don't have uses for every part of the buffalo. Now, the funny thing is a lot of these bones I'm pulling out, like you could just chew right through them. They're soft. That's just, that's just not a texture I'm going for. You know what I'm saying? Oh, imagine like a big burrito or some tacos. This would be perfect for that. That'd also be a really good way to get somebody to try it, I bet. Make this alongside some chicken or something. So they have a standard option, but you know, get them to try a, like, hey, try a squirrel taco. Certainly looks amazing. All right, I think I'm done. Holy crap, that took a while. All right, so I need to fish the shot out of the bottom of our braising liquid. Okay, hopefully that bowl will sit there. I'm just gonna run, run it all through a strainer. Okay, I washed the crusty stuff out of the Dutch oven. Get that stuff back in there. I think I ended up finding a total of four or five pieces of shot. How about a gigantic turner to pick this up. I'm gonna spill this everywhere. Man, that looks good. So we can turn the fire back on now. Might as well start giving it a fair amount of heat. About to put some cold stock in here. So the plan is I just want to add enough chicken stock to where I can float a couple dumplings. I'd like this to be really meaty. So I don't want to add any more chicken stock than I need to. Enough to float and cook the dumplings, I guess, is the minimum. Yeah, I better go ahead and go ahead and put it all in there. And then rinse. Then a little rinse. See what that looks like. Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be meaty. There's a lot of meat on squirrels. You know, four little gray squirrels. This can feed quite a few people. All right, actually I'm gonna turn this back down on low. I need to mix my dumplings. So the preacher used Bisquick for his dumplings. I don't have any Bisquick, but there's a recipe on the back of my Hudson cream self-rising flour. So I'm gonna go with that. We'll try and make a half, yeah, we'll try and make a half batch. Problem with that is the egg so we'll beat the egg first and then get rid of half of it and then go from there. There we go, maybe something like that. See, it calls for three tablespoons of oil. Man, I use no poison oil. Lard, lard's what we use around here. So can we just end the video here? Like, would that be okay? Because I really don't want to show you guys what happened next. You know, some of you might know, adding the lard to the dumplings was very stupid. And I knew it was stupid when I was doing it, but I thought it was a little bit stupid. I didn't realize it was like disastrously stupid. 
the dumplings broke apart into nothing. So all I did was make really thick squirrel gravy with a very funny texture that looks kind of gross. And that's such a letdown, man, because you know I've edited the video. I'm done with it. That close up of the frying looks so good. And that part where I've got the pile of meat and I'm talking about tacos and burritos, you had to want a squirrel burrito. I feel like the majority of people who watch this video are going to want a squirrel taco at that moment. And I don't want to ruin it. So I'm going to give you the option to close your eyes. I'm going to show you the final product for just a couple seconds. Coming up like three, two, one. There it is. You know, Gordon Ramsay would say that looks like a dog's dinner. It was so good though. Like the taste was amazing. I just need to make better dumplings next time. Now today while I was editing the video, I had this on the smoker. This is the first slab of bacon I've ever made. Raised the pig and slaughtered the pig myself. And on this first one, I kind of mangled the, the belly. Skinning this part was pretty challenging. I'm gonna do it a completely different way next time. But this is looking pretty good. So this is a totally simple bacon. Just the pink curing salt and regular salt. And then I smoked it in a pellet smoker with hickory pellets. So it should be pretty simple, straightforward bacon. I only did the one today. I've got four of them ready to go that have been curing, but I'm a little bit worried about like the salt level. So I wanted to finish this one up and try it. All right, let me try and cut this thing if I can. I'm gonna have a slicer, but I don't have it here right now. Man, every knife I have is dull. How's that look? That looks pretty amazing. Slices came out okay. Put the cap back on the end. Let's go fry up these pieces. See how it tastes. The other mistake I think I made on this bacon was not drying it out after the, the wet cure. I just took it out of the cure, rinsed it off, dried it off and put it on the smoker. And from what I read, a lot of people will leave it in the refrigerator 24 hours just to get that surface dried up a little bit. That is a crazy amount of fat for three pieces of bacon. I don't like to get my bacon too crispy. I like it to have some chew. I think I'm gonna go ahead and pull out this thinnest piece. Yeah, these are done. Right, this piece has had a minute to cool. We'll start with it. That is so good. And it is so salty. Like it's not ruined or anything. It's not that salty, but I'm gonna soak the others in some plain water. Yeah, second piece, same way. Just a little bit too much salt, that's okay. All right, thanks for joining me, folks. It's been a really long one, but I've had a lot of fun filming it. So the next video is gonna be 308. We're gonna be shooting that Tika. So I'll see you guys then.